Uh, recording is in progress, and we are welcome back to NSMA's uh, Tuesday, May 17, 2022 uh, afternoon session. We're going to kick it off with satellite mega constellations. And uh, we have Trey Hambury, partner at Jenner and Block, and Professor David Coplow. I'm going to give a little introduction to both of them. Some of you know one or both of them, but not all of you. So I wanted to make sure everyone understood uh, the gentlemen who are speaking uh, for us this afternoon on a very important subject that's been uh, around the hoop at NSMA uh, for uh, most, most of its 37 years. So Trey is a, is a partner with Jenner and Block and here in the Washington DC office. He's also co-chair of the communica communications internet and technology practice there. He has extensive experience working for the private and public sectors on a variety of communications policy issues, uh, including wireless, spectrum, satellite, and international uh, telecom matters. And, and Trey came to Jenner and Block from another firm and prior to that time from Sprint Nextel, where he served as a director of government affairs. In that position, Trey acted as regulatory counsel in major rulemaking proceedings, mergers and acquisitions, and cases before the FCC, the National Telecom and Information Administration, the Department of Commerce, Department of Justice and Homeland Security Department, and as well as Congress and the federal courts. So quite a wide billet. Uh, prior to working for Sprint and Nextel, Trey held a variety of policymaking positions at the FCC itself, including working on numerous satellite and international telecom manners in the International Bureau. He served as special counsel in the Office of General Counsel, where he was responsible for providing policy and legal advice to the Office of the Chairman on wireless issues. Trey's a graduate of the University of Virginia School of Law, where he served as the Hardy Cross Dillard Fellow, and he's currently co-chair of the FCC, uh, Federal Communications Bar Association's Wireless Committee. So welcome, Trey. And also want to introduce you to Professor Coplow. Professor David Coplow specializes in the area of uh, pu uh, public international law and national security law. Uh, he joined Georgetown uh, Law's faculty in 1981. His principal courses have been international law, one, the introductory survey of public international law topics, uh, a seminar in the areas of arms control, non-proliferation and, and terrorism, and the pro seminar for LLM students in national security law. So he's on both ends of the spectrum there. And the, in addition, he has directed a clinic, the Center for Applied Legal Studies, in which students provide pro bono representation for refugees who seek asylum in the United States because of persecution in their homelands. His government service has included stints as special counsel for arms control to the general counsel of the Department of Defense from 2009 to 2011, as deputy general counsel for international affairs at the Department of Defense from 1997 to 1999, and as attorney advisor and special assistant to, assistant to the director of US Arms Control and Disarmament Agency from 1978 to 1981. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Yale Law School and a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, most of his scholarly writing concentrates on the intersection between international law and U.S. constitutional law, especially in the areas of arms control and national security and treaty negotiation and implementation. And uh, right on time, Professor Coplo also is on a uh, uh, featured story in Washington Lawyer with uh, the May-June uh, edition, and I'm holding it up, and, uh, uh, but there's a really good article on close encounters and space debris and liability issues. And you actually get a get a free picture of the professor if you look carefully. So, um, but um, uh, just want to make sure everyone uh, understood where these uh, these speakers are coming from, and uh, they're uh, uh, we're super excited to talk about satellite mega constellations for a variety of good reasons. Um, there's a lot happening uh, since last year. I know Trey spoke a little with us last year. And I, I'll just leave it, uh, I'll, I'll just have Trey, maybe you can just kick it off and go through a, maybe a set of issues that you uh, and slides you might have. And then, then we'll let Professor Coplo uh, speak extemporaneously from his deep well of knowledge. And then maybe we'll take a few questions and answers. Uh, so go, go for it. And again, a pleasure to have you both here. Thank you, I'm truly honored. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. And I'll go ahead and throw up the slides there. What I was going to focus on was the, the spectrum aspects. And it sounds like Professor Coplow might want to focus on the orbital debris aspects. But uh, you know, I think between the two of us, we'll begin to scratch the surface of some of the many issues that are raised by these new types of uh, mega constellations and, and the spectrum and orbital resource constraints that they may face. So if you'll humor me for a moment, I'll put the slides up and hopefully we can begin. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, before just getting started, you know, I was looking back at trying to prepare for this conversation and thinking, especially with this audience, just how special Spectrum is as a resource. And I was going back to a paper written by uh, Greg Rostin, actually, uh, several years ago, where he talked at some length about, and he's an economist um, uh, at Stanford, also used to be at the FCC. And uh, he talked at some length about how Spectrum is really a unique natural resource, that it can't be created, can't be destroyed, can't be exhausted. That is, what you do with it at one moment in time doesn't affect what you do with it the next moment in time. And you know, in that sense, it's really unlike anything that we deal with. And it's not oil or gas or uh, much of anything else in terms of natural resources. And it's these unique properties that I find really fascinating and that are really beginning to tax the FCC's ability to manage this resource for the public benefit. And it's that that's really fascinated me in the context of the satellite spectrum sharing regime that these new mega constellations will be embarking on. And not all of them, by the way, are mega constellations. Some are mini constellations that they might only have only a few hundred satellites or even a few dozen or, or even fewer, but they're all occupying the same frequency spectrum in many cases, and they all have to share this common resource. And the FCC is charged with both licensing them and then sorting out how to prioritize rights among them. And that's no mean feat. So let's go to how the FCC licenses the systems. And as Joe mentioned, I did review some of these issues last year, but it seemed worthwhile to kind of revisit just some very basics with respect to how the FCC licenses satellites. So to me, it's very interesting that the FCC process is really triggered by what happens in the marketplace. So when a new non-geostationary orbit fixed satellite service system uh, files for resources, that can trigger a processing round procedure. So once that initial applicant satisfies certain basic criteria, uh, often just simple eligibility and, and meeting performance criteria for the ban, then the FCC will issue a public notice calling for competing applications by a certain cutoff date. And that begins a process by which many other applicants can enter the um, competition in some sense for resources. And the FC will evaluate all of those applications together. And interestingly enough, after, um, after some initial criticism and uh, some treaty negotiations that resulted in a trade agreement, uh, now the FC, or the FC has for quite some time now, offer the same treatment for non-US licensed systems uh, as they do for domestic systems. So you need not be only licensed or only pursue a license in the US. Uh, you can actually gain market access on an equal basis in the same processing round, so long as that your system, your non-US system is either in orbit or has a license from another country or has sought ITU coordination. And so the idea is to put everyone on an equal footing and give everyone a fair shot at access to the spectrum resources that have been triggered by that initial application. And then after having gathered up all of the applicants by a single cutoff date, the FCC then reviews all the applications at once and grants all of them that are qualified by the basic criteria that they've established oops, for the ban. So um, the question then becomes, uh, what do you do when all of these different systems try to access the same spectrum at the same time. There is no a priori correct way to share the spectrum. Um, they're all, especially with constellations that have numerous non-geostationary satellites, they will often come into alignment with one another and put demands on the same spectrum resource at the same time. Well, the FCC in the bit of, um, a bit of wisdom borrowed from the Bible, essentially said that they would split 
the resource, that if you're going to occupy the same space at a fairly low threshold, 6% delta T over T, kind of a system noise threshold, it's fairly low, uh, then you'll, we'll just divide it in half and, or by the number of operators who are all demanding the same spectrum resource at the same time. And the idea was, I think, compelling in that this fairly draconian way of dividing the resource, which may not at all be the most efficient, would encourage private negotiation and coordination because there's probably better ways to do it. You could share in time, you could, uh, maybe the uh, one operator doesn't need 50% at some times, but they actually could want 75% of the spectrum resource at another, or maybe uh, certain types of events would be non-interference events for one operator based on the, their particular system characteristics. And so providing this opportunity for operator to operator negotiations with a fairly draconian penalty for a failure to arrive at a solution would help encourage private agreements among the parties. Well, that could work. There is one complication though. There are a lot of systems and we have a lot of different processing rounds and not all of these operators have sat still. So in other words, they have modified their applications over time. And so we have now multiple processing rounds. And the question is, well, what happens as you reach multiple intersection events, multiple operators putting uh, demands on spectrum resources from the same round? And then what happens if you have a subsequent round? The idea of a processing round is kind of a first come, first serve that earlier processing round, earlier in time licensees should have something more because by virtue of having been first, then should the later arrivals. But how much more and how does that very low threshold, which is really a prelude to negotiation, get sorted out? The FCC never really said that the later in time applicants or licensees get X percent less or have fewer opportunities by Y percent over time than the earlier time in time licensees, only that they are entitled to something more, but how and when and how often? And then what happens if the earlier in time licensee modifies their system in some fundamental way? Has that so changed the character of their system that they're no longer entitled to the first in time protections associated with those earlier licensees? And then of course, as I said originally, the more entities that are all putting demands on that same resource at the same time, it's one thing to negotiate one to one, it's quite another to negotiate one to six or one to 10 or one to 12, a lot harder to reach agreement. And of course, the more numerous the constellation, the more frequent the types of intersection events, that is the occasions when all of the uh, satellites or the points of access might line up in some unfavorable way. And so you're talking about lots of different scenarios that all have to be hammered out and negotiated in this concept. And so that's fundamentally, oops, sorry, uh, fundamentally a problem that the FCC is actually wrestling with right now. So they commenced a rulemaking proceeding on the rule that established this 6% delta T over T, very low threshold for negotiation and asked all these questions. How do multiple NGSO authorization holders that are licensed in different rounds negotiate these issues? How do they share the same spectrum? Under what conditions? Under what times? And so the idea is this was originally a case-by-case -case basis, but we don't have that anymore. We have a much more complicated and dynamic situation because we've really never had a situation where there are multiple sequential processing rounds with multiple systems that all seem likely to come to fruition, or maybe not all, but many seem likely to come to fruition. It's not as if we can count on failure to solve this sharing problem. That is for some systems not to launch. We're going to have to deal with this very complex sharing problem. And so how do we navigate that process? And that's where we've seen really an interesting set of ideas emerge from the licensees. Um, so, for example, uh, SpaceX had proposed that later in round, later round NGSO systems uh, 
protect earlier round systems up to a specified interference to noise ratio. And then interestingly, sunset that protection at some point so that there's not a permanent entitlement to a superior right for the indefinite future, just because you filed an application a year before or six months before another. It's an interesting idea. Lots of other operators came in with their own ideas. Uh, Kepler said that that I to N standard uh, reference criteria uh, would be good. And they supported it, even though because you're using standard reference design parameters, it's quite likely you're not gonna match any particular system exactly. You're gonna overprotect or underprotect compared to the standard because no system is precisely in line with that standard. Uh, Viasat interestingly proposed a network performance degradation metric that the theoretical interference or exceeding some industry set standard doesn't matter. What really matters, Viasat said, is do you harm my throughput, my capacity in some meaningful way? If it's measurable, if it's affecting the performance that I can deliver to a consumer, that's what's matter. That's what matters, and that's what we should solve for. Amazon had a similar idea, and these are all mega constellation or constellations of NGSO systems all in the same round, uh, or all in the same multiple rounds in some cases, but they're all in the mix. And they had uh, a similar proposal to Viasat, but with a little greater specificity. It's defined here, but essentially, if you're going to affect the carrier to noise ratio above a certain threshold value that you will so degrade our performance over time, over a period of a year, that that should be taken into account. Below that threshold, we shouldn't even worry about it. Above that threshold, that is the level of protection that should be offered. Um, Boeing, interestingly enough, said you should calculate, as I read it, calculate the actual system interference that each system is going to experience. A lot of calculations involved with that approach, but a greater degree of accuracy. O3B said, you know, instead of splitting the baby down the middle, what if we split it 75% for earlier round systems, 25% for later round systems? And AST and Science, which I've got a typo there, but AST and Science. Uh, said that you should raise that trigger. So instead of having a really low threshold that would cause the split to occur, that you should move it a little bit higher to a one dB increase in the noise floor, which is a common measure of interference. So not a lot of consensus, a lot of different ideas on how much protection these systems should receive. And there was similar disagreement on how long the protection should last. So AST and science said six years, Mangata said uh, that it should be no less than the life of the satellite, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, Boeing said it would introduce instability to have any kind of sunset, that there should be a permanent entitlement so that if you file early, you should be entitled into the definite, indefinite future with the superior right. And part of Boeing's justification I found very interesting that this instability would discourage financial investment in new networks. And that in fact, the operators needed this property like entitlement in order to invest commercially in this very you know, dynamic, um, uh, complex and frankly costly sector that it, you needed that certain backdrop. Um, one other angle that the FCC had raised was how one system protects another. And I found this especially interesting from a spectrum point of view, because an important element of sharing is spectrum awareness. You've got to know what else is out there. And the more you know, in some sense, the easier it is to coordinate. If you know that the only other station on a terrestrial context that you need to coordinate with or worry about is in California and you're in New York, coordination could be quite easy depending on the frequency band. By the same token, if you know the location and the beam pointing information of those satellites, it's a lot easier to avoid them. There'll be a lot of satellites, that's a lot of information. And on the terrestrial side, knowing the beam pointing information means knowing that particular location, that is a customer location, pretty sensitive information for a lot of companies. Um, but if we know that information, it allows for much more intensive use of the spectrum resource. And so SpaceX, Amazon and others 
called for greater, have called for greater transparency around these location types of information because doing so will allow us to get closer and closer and make more intensive use of that resource. Well, not everyone agreed. Boeing uh, rejected that because it was exceedingly proprietary and commercially sensitive. And it could also impinge on their ability to change dynamically, they said, if there were a disaster or some other kind of uh, resource constraint required on the fly re-engineering. O3B had a similar rejection of the FCC's or the SpaceX proposal to share beam pointing information because it ignored or downplayed the substantial competitive and national security risks. Actually, I'll be very interested uh, in the professor's views on the national security side as well. Uh, Viasat, meanwhile, characterized that the sharing of beam pointing information as unworkable and unnecessary. Now, others have pointed out, well, in terms of the security issues, it could be that a third party database could come overcome some of those concerns. But even those who are supporting that acknowledge that building confidence won't happen overnight and that you really do need to invest time and energy into building up that database. So one of the issues that I want to come back to was a theme in a lot of these comments, whether we're talking about how you share, how you protect, how long that protection needs to last. So much of it comes back to this phrase, investment-backed expectations, which really arises out of property rights and property rights law. And I found that interesting because the Communications Act says that the commission is charged with granting the right to use the spectrum, but not ownership thereof. And yet this property rights concept keeps coming back. And I think it goes back to the thing I mentioned at the outset, that it is spectrum, this very unique natural resource. It has a lot of the attributes of property. You can exclude people from it. You get to buy and sell it. You certainly get to use it. And with a renewal expectancy, there's some expectation that you get to retain it potentially indefinitely. At the same time, it is not quite a property right because you have all of these regulatory responsibilities. Certainly that's the case in the broadcast context, but even in the wireless setting or the satellite setting, there's an obligation to share. That seems to be acknowledged that it is a shared resource, especially for satellites. And the FC is going to be necessarily be adopting protection criteria, even as we're building these satellite systems. And it's almost a guarantee that the spectrum sharing criteria that the FCC establishes in this proceeding will change over time as the technology changes. And so the question is, how do you calibrate the regulatory environment in a way that doesn't defeat the investment back expectations of the licensee and frustrate all of the deployment efforts that the NGSO operators are pursuing today. So actually, I'll just share these two cases. One, because I love these cases, they're some of my favorites, um, but two, I think they're instructive here and, they're, and we've got great pictures. So uh, one case is Pennsylvania coal versus Mahan. And so in Pennsylvania, at the time, there was rampant coal mining, tons of coal mining. And in fact, there was coal mining under Scranton and half the city basically collapsed. People died, they were trapped in their houses, uh, schools, it was a disaster. And so that happened in the 19 teens. And then by 21, they passed a law that said, you know, you can't mine beneath land that has buildings on it. Just, it's a bad idea. We wind up with situations like this one in 1914. And so uh, this company, Pennsylvania Coal, had paid Mahan in 1878 for the rights to mine underneath his property. But then this law passed and said that they essentially uh, they couldn't do it. Well, when the coal company moved to mine the subsurface coal, Mahan sued. And he said that Justice Holmes, writing for the court, eight to one decision, he said that a taking, that is a sort of a government confiscation of the property, um, occurred because Pennsylvania, the change in the law, made it commercially impractical to, another typo, I apologize, to mine the coal. 
and it had nearly the same effect as the complete destruction of the property rights that the coal company had reserved. So taking all the value is clearly a little too far for the court to tolerate. And that has a really interesting counterpoint in Penn Central versus New York City. Now, you may be familiar with Penn Central. It does not have a gigantic uh, building on top of it today. Part of the reason is, in fact, this case, this uh, landmarks preservation law in 1965 empowered the city to designate certain landmarks as, or certain structures as landmarks. And one of them, one such designation was to designate Penn Central, you know, Grand Central Terminal, um, which was owned by Penn Central, uh, designate this 1913 building as a landmark. They did. And uh, essentially in a 6-3 decision, Justice Brennan said, you know, the economic impact of this landmarks designation and particularly the extent to which the regulation has interfered in investment back expectations are relevant, but so too is the character of the government action. And so in this case, the court found that um, this was not a physical invasion. This is just a public program for adjusting the benefits and burdens of economic life to promote the public good. In other words, it's a regulation in the public interest, not a take. It wouldn't defeat investment-backed expectations for failure to, you know, for the inability to build this large multi-story office tower above uh, Grand Central Terminal. So um, this kind of tees up and this is my last slide, last comment, and apologize for taking perhaps too much time on this, but it's kind of fun for me. Um, how then are we to think about spectrum? You know, clearly we know it's not property. The Communications Act tells us that. Uh, spectrum sharing is not exactly the kind of physical invasion that's gonna cause buildings to subside and, and destroy all economic value, but spectrum does definitely look like property. And if we alter those rights, especially mid-flight, it's going to change investment set incentives. So where on that scale do we fall? How do we calibrate these obligations? Are we going to lean toward the notion that these rights are held in trust for the public? Is the FC really obliged, required to regulate in the public interest, kind of creating a larger benefit for all? Or does that stopping short of something less than a full-fledged property right, does that so undermine the incentives to invest that we're gonna destroy this golden goose of satellite services that really does promise a sea change in how we connect and where we can connect. And that's, I think, the bigger picture of what the FCC is wrestling with and one of the things that I wanted to spend at least a little time uh, talking about today. So with that kind of flyover, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Professor Cudlow. Excellent. Thank you, Trey and Professor. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, well thank you. And I, I must say, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. And I look forward to continuing uh, a very interesting and productive discussion that, that Trey has started us with. This is my first engagement with this group. And as the newcomer, as the guest here, I thought I should take on the burden of trying to be provocative, if nothing else and offer you a set of comments that I hope you'll find interesting and engaging, even if not fully persuasive. And in that vein, the title of my remarks, and I do not have slides to burden you with today, um, the title of my remarks could be something like, three things I hate about mega constellations of small satellites. <laughs> and I gotta say, as soon as I spit that out, I wanna retreat a little bit because I don't hate these things and I recognize there's enormous benefits to the world in communications and remote sensing and all sorts of other applications. So let me just offer it as three things to be concerned about or three points to be, uh, to be attentive to in evaluating the value of mega constellations of small satellites. And the three points that I wanna highlight are first, uh, congestion or, and debris, uh, second, interference with other uses of space. And here I'm particularly focused on ground-based astronomy. And third, the uh, obscuring of the distinction between military and civilian 
satellites and uses of space. And I'll go through each of those briefly enough that we can have some time for discussion. So my first point is a concern about congestion and debris, which I'm sure is well-known material to this group. Uh, space is a big place. It is not overcrowded even by a few thousand satellites, but not every region of space is equally valuable. And in the regions that are of greatest utility, there is a problem with overcrowding and the potential of even more overcrowding in the next few years as thousands upon thousands of additional small satellites are likely to be uh, uh, likely to be put up. It's a special problem when those satellites have little or no maneuverability uh, to be able to avoid uh, anticipated collisions. Uh, and it's a special problem when we have, as today, limited sit space situational awareness, not knowing exactly where every satellite is and where it's going to be in the immediate future. And it's also a special problem when we have so limited capability for active debris removal. Again, that's a problem that might be ameliorated in the future, but at least as, as of today, there's very little ability to do anything about the pollution that we observe in space uh, uh, and, and increasing in space. And that uh, uh, raises the specter of collisions and each collision would not only damage or destroy the two satellites involved, but create additional debris that could create a chain reaction, the phenomenon sometimes referred to as the Kessler syndrome, where there's an uncontrollable cascade of debris that jeopardizes all the satellites in that orbit or near that orbit. And some observers think we're already at or near that point today in some regions of space where because of the population uh, occurring, the prospect of this chain reaction of debris uh, may be unavoidable. To me, this is the classic case of the tragedy of the commons, where there are so many co-users, each of whom has an incentive to use the resource aggressively, none of whom has a sufficient incentive to husband the resource, to protect it for others, and therefore we wind up overusing the resource to the detriment of all. We foul our own nest in a way that makes uh, that region of space unusable for the long duration. Space law, the space treaties provide some measure of protection about this. They provide a tort remedy where there are uh, collisions in space, but it's a very imperfect remedy. Uh, it requires a showing that one user is at fault, essentially a negligence regime, and that can be very difficult to prove in space. And, has, and that provision has never been utilized in the case of a space-to-space -space collision. It's also a problem because the United States cannot solve this problem by itself. There are so many other countries that have launch capability that uh, international cooperation, not just national level, would be needed. And that's a special problem because, as you know, the Outer Space Treaty has this unusual feature of making a state responsible for the actions in space undertaken by its nationals. So that if a particular operator causes harm to another, it's not just a problem for that operator, it's a problem for that operator's country. Uh, and Uncle Sam is on, board, is on the line when a US person or corporation causes harm to another in space. So that's the first problem, is that the mega constellations will greatly exacerbate uh, and perhaps fatally cause congestion and uh, through debris in space that may render regions of space unusable uh, for all. Second problem I want to identify is the, uh, the potential problem of interference with other users. And the one that I'm particularly focused on is ground-based astronomy. Uh, astronomy is enormously important for the world, not only the pure science value of exploring the expanses of the universe and the origins of the universe, not only the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, but more practically, the planetary defense capabilities of locating and identifying incoming asteroids or other near-Earth objects that may pose a hazard to the, to, to the world, uh, and the value of space situational awareness, being aware not only of, of, uh, of spacecraft that are orbiting, but of missile launches, uh, either tests or uses by an adversary. All of that depends uh, in large measure on ground-based astronomy. And there's always been a problem of potential interference, actual interference, with bright 
objects, satellites or aircraft, uh, and with noisy objects. Uh, the radio frequency spectrum interferes with radio astronomy in the same way that bright objects interfere, interfere with optical astronomy. But this collection of problems is now much worse than it has been in the past, and is anticipated to be much, much worse in the near future. There have been some modest efforts to temper the problem by reducing the albedo of the brightness of some satellites, but those are, insofar as those remain voluntary and episodic, they do not present a satisfactory uh, system-wide solution to the problem, and therefore something more needs to be done. Uh, this again <clears throat> is an area where um, there are possible remedies. It's possible to move astronomy into space, and there have been efforts to, to do that, but, and, and that'd be valuable, but it's frightfully expensive and beyond reach of many uh, observatories. Uh, International law appears to offer a partial solution in that the Outer Space Treaty requires countries to be grounded, guided by the principle of cooperation and mutual assistance and to conduct their activities in space with due regard for the corresponding interests of others and sets out a procedure for consultation in the event of potential, in the expectation of potentially harmful interference. But my argument is that's just not nearly enough and the world faces a very serious oncoming problem with the, uh, with the degradation of ground-based astronomy. And it just it seems unfair for new users to be able to command the resource and inflict uh, disadvantages on the prior users uh, who, who will, will suffer from the interference of the mega constellations. The third point that I want to raise is about the interplay between military and civilian spacecraft. And this one takes a little bit of, of, of a background tutorial on areas of international law that may not be quite as familiar to this group. And that is the law of armed conflict. Law of armed conflict starts with the basic principle of discrimination or distinction. that specifies that in a time of war, a military is allowed to shoot at the enemy military. You can target military personnel and objectives, but you cannot directly target civilians. That's the first fundamental principle, is the distinction between military and civilians. You can target the military, you cannot target civilians. And that's well accepted as the foundation of the law of armed conflict. An important corollary for that principle is the requirement for separation. A military is required to separate itself from civilians in part, this physical separation in part is required to spare the civilians some of the worst effects of the fighting, and also to enable the opposing military to adhere to their international obligations to aim only at our military and not at our civilians. If the military and the civilians are too closely intertwined, it would not be possible to target only the military. Now, this obligation for separation is important, it's hard law, it's accepted by everyone around the world, um, but it's limited in an important way. Separation is required only to the extent that it is feasible to do so. And feasibility is one of those marvelously vague words that defies definition. Uh, under some circumstances, in some settings, it would obviously be impossible, it would be unfeasible to separate the Interstate highway system in the United States, for example, is used interchangeably by military and civilian. It would obviously not be feasible, be absurd to require the construction of separate roads and bridges and tunnels, one for use by the military and one by the civilians. That would not be feasible. And similarly, the national electric grid, the local systems for delivery of water and collection of sewage, those are fully dual use and could not be separated. But in other areas, separation is quite feasible. For example, it would obviously be unacceptable to put a military headquarters on the grounds of a hospital. It would be, in, it'd be unacceptable to put anti-aircraft installations on the roof of a school. If you did that, that would be a violation of the principle of separation. It'd be a violation of the fundamental requirement for distinction or discrimination. Uh, I've, I've recently written a, a law review article in the Harvard National Security Journal that goes into this in some detail. And in that article, I highlight one case study that might be familiar with some of you. Uh, that is during the first Gulf War in 1991, 
Saddam Hussein uh, infamously parked two of his uh, best MiG-21 fighters on the apron of a famous archeological site, an, an ancient temple uh, outside Baghdad. And he did that for the obvious purpose of deterring the coalition from attacking those, those jets or possibly to bait them into attacking and then exploiting for a public relations value the collateral damage that would be inflicted on the temple. In that case, his action worked. It was widely criticized by the United States and everybody else as a violation of this principle of separation, a violation of discrimination or distinction. But in fact, the allies refrained from attacking those sites, it, that, that, those jets, it, it protected them um, in violation of the law of armed conflict. Today, in outer space, it is the United States that's violating this principle of separation. It's the United States that has adopted as a national policy through several recent administrations, the principle of using as much as possible the civilian assets for military and intelligence community purposes. And therefore we see a growing reliance of the military upon civilian uh, space objects for communications, for remote sensing, uh, the use of civilian launch vehicles for uh, as planned mechanisms for putting military and intelligence community satellites into space, and the understanding that in a time of armed conflict, the military and the intelligence community will rely even more heavily upon civilians for, uh, for those services in support of military operations. Uh, th sometimes the argument for doing this collaboration between civilian and military. Sometimes it's, it's explained in terms of saving money, that it's cheaper to use the civilian functions, or that civilians are better at uptake of new technology, all of which sounds a little bit like a feasibility argument. But underpinning it, sometimes, you hear another rationale expressed, and that is that sometimes the greater reliance upon a vast array of civilian small satellites and, and mega constellations is designed deliberately to complicate the task of an enemy military that might in a time of armed conflict attempt anti-satellite operations. And if they could target only a small number of dedicated military and intelligence community satellites, those anti-satellite operations might be effective. But if instead they were confronted with a vast armada of civilian satellites that were supporting the communications, uh, uh, remote sensing, and other functions of the military, the enemy would be deterred from attacking them. It would just be too hard a problem. And like Saddam Hussein's jets, that might actually work, but it's exactly what the law of armed conflict is designed to prevent. It's designed, the law of armed conflict is designed to avoid spreading the dangers of armed conflict over the civilians is designed to concentrate those risks on the military and to protect the civilians. And the US policy here is, is precisely in, the, in opposition to that. It's using the civilians as a way of shielding the military and enabling more effective military and intelligence community operations. So those are my three complaints, concerns, uh, uh, things I hate about uh, mega constellations and small satellites, the danger of congestion and debris, the danger of obscuring other uses of, uh, of space assets, and the danger of, uh, of confounding the law of armed conflict obligation of separation or distinction. Thank you, and I look forward to a discussion. Great. Thank you, Professor. Uh, and thank you, Trey. Uh, I think the table's well set. Um, the I guess in the big picture, if either of you uh, were made king for a day uh, uh, of the world, what would you do to alter, if anything, the current structure when it comes to satellite mega constellation deployment? Good. Well, um, I'll, I'll pick it up and, and uh, see what sort of reaction this gets. But uh, you, Professor, you, you wanted to provoke. I'm provoked. Uh, I... <laughs> I, uh, I I wanted to at least challenge this assumption that um, you know the law of armed conflict would be somehow uh, violated because I think the reality is there's not even the U.S. Defense Department could launch something on the order of a mega constellation just in terms of the multi-year 
commitment, the level of activity necessary to support that. It does, to me at least, much more closely resemble the interstate highway system or our public uh, switch telephone network or some sort of very sweeping and broad infrastructure project because of the multi-year nature of the launch commitment, the huge commitment of resources on a global scale, it's hard to separate out the um, defense purpose from the, you know, the potential utility and defensive purposes uh, from the uh, utility in the sort of commercial space as well. And it just seems as if the analogy to putting MiG fighter jets near a uh, archaeologically important site is is strained at best. So let me respond exactly on that point. For me, the proper comparison is space activities compared to military activities that are undertaken in every other domain. The Navy, for example, builds its own Navy vessels, multi-year, enormously expensive enterprise, and the Navy undertakes the responsibility of building those and does not say, well, in a time of armed conflict, we'll just use all these civilian ships. We'll take over cargo ships. We'll, hire, we'll contract with private yacht owners. They don't do that. They keep civilians separate and they build their own very expensive, very elaborate, very time consuming, not always perfectly well done assets. The Army does the same thing. They build their own trucks. They build their own military equipment. The, the, the Air Force does not use private aircraft. It builds its own, even though that's expensive and takes a long time. They separate military from civilian activities. I think we should be doing the same thing in space. Wow. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm not sure that I agree because I think it goes both ways. One, I don't think systems like... Um, uh, the mega constellations would exist, but for some support from the commercial defense sector, because they're purchasing capacity, they're presumably using it for Earth observation, or you know, there are a lot of different models out there available. So I don't know that the commercial space sector exists without some level of government activity. Uh, conversely, I don't know that the government has access to a, a, a system as advanced and as sophisticated as some of the mega constellations are, unless the commercial industry is involved, there's this symbiosis that I think has to occur in order to have the asset exist. So I, I got no problem with the government contracting with the private sector and hiring the best minds and buying the best technology, as long as it remains a government asset that's separated from the civilian uses. And in the other domains too, there's a technology flow, there's a synergy between the public sector and the private sector. And sometimes the private sector is ahead and sometimes the public sector is ahead. I think the same kind of thing should happen in space. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess I would just count myself on a, in a different place. And I, I'm concerned by say reports such as that from the Atlantic Council just earlier this month that says the US is probably going to lose space superiority to China uh, within the decade. Uh, that we are, you know, we are trying to hold ourselves to account or you would have us hold ourselves to account uh, to the law of armed conflict in a situation where we know actors uh, are not going to abide by that standard. I mean, we've seen it in the Ukraine with Russia. Uh, we certainly saw it in, um, in Iraq, uh, we will no doubt see it again. And I think it's still in tension with this fundamental concern that mega constellations or advanced satellite infrastructure of the type that we're talking about, which is a multi-year launch commitment, huge investment of resources over an extended period of time that consumes both spectrum orbital and, and terrestrial resources, uh, that it doesn't happen but for the symbiosis between commercial and, and government sectors. And my fundamental, so, so uh, you are not alone. In fact, I am uh, very much out on a limb with this, I, uh, with this argument. I, I, I promised that I wanted to be provocative today. Um, but at core, my argument is just the rule of law. If the United States wants to be a country that adheres to legal requirements, if the United States wants to promote the rule of law around the world, then we got to follow the rule of the law ourselves even if others don't. That's fundamentally what the law, the, the rule of law means. And if you don't like it, then change the law 
Law can be changed, international law can be changed, but as long as the law requires separation, the United States should be doing that. Well, on that note, by the way, this is so fascinating. I'd like to invite you both back maybe for a full scale webinar on this and maybe even a publish uh, point counterpoint. Um, <laughs> so, uh, cause there's a lot to be mined here. And uh, of course, like spectrum, uh, the other resource that we don't control is time. So uh, I, we have a, 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 another uh, a panel that's starting imminently. Uh, I, I can't thank you guys enough. It's been an amazing pleasure to have you both on in this panel. There's clearly uh, uh, you know, cascading rivers of information to be, to be uh, swam through and filtered and, uh, and cultivated for sea life. So uh, let's, uh, let's spend a little bit more time on this uh, in uh, venues uh, of our design to expand. So uh, again, thank you so much, Professor Coplo. Thank you, Trey, as always, uh, and uh, look forward to, to more of this type of discussion. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.